So welcome and good morning again, everybody, to our second speaker of this day, of the <coughs> third day of the La Confoucault Conference. And it's my pleasure to welcome and to introduce Aaron Schuster, former fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies at the University of Rijeka, Croatia, and the Institute for Cultural Inquiry, ICI, Berlin, I may add former fellow of the Antoinette Academy in Maastricht. He's currently the head of the theory program at the Sandberg Institute in Amsterdam, Netherlands. And his book, The Trouble with Pleasure, Deleuze and Psychoanalysis, is forthcoming with MIT Press in February 2016. We're all very much looking forward to it. He's the author of many articles treating such subject as the debt drive, the politics of laziness, corruption, sexuality and thought, the philosophy of tickling, the history of levitation, the comedy of Ernst Lubitsch, Kafka's philosopher dog, and complaining. And as a philosopher of complaining, I give you the word. <laughs> Thank you, it's terrible to be here. No, um, <laughs> I'd like to thank the organizers, and that was actually a great experience on my first trip to Beirut. Um, so, Foucault and Lacan, what can we do with this question? In the background, always when we're dealing with psychoanalysis and philosophy, is the more global problem, what is the relationship between psychoanalysis and philosophy? And near as I can tell, there's kind of three modalities. Either philosophy and psychoanalysis are allies, in a kind of joint project to think a decentered subject that would not be the master in its own house. Either they're kind of rivals, uh, with philosophers kind of purporting to expose the naive metaphysics of psychoanalysis, where psychoanalysis could uncover the hidden structures of philosophy. Or they are kind of strangers. So strangers who met, but who nevertheless are quite independent and autonomous with respect to their procedures and concerns. Now, what's interesting is that Foucault, and in the same way Deleuze, seems to follow all three of these approaches in his career. At one point, he's allied with psychoanalysis, at another point, a vicious critic, and then finally, he seems to be, in fact, rather indifferent and can go his own way and let psychoanalysis go its own way. Um, What's quite interesting is, so in the, in the case of Deleuze and Foucault, you see kind of parallel structure, and you also see that Lacan was a very good, somehow, at hystericizing his readers. So even at the moment when you have the most kind of vicious criticisms of psychoanalysis, those critics, the most intelligent ones, will always say at some moment, but maybe this doesn't apply to Lacan. We don't know exactly what he means, but somehow he escapes. So even in Anti-Oedipus, it's clear that Deleuze and Guattari give Lacan a way out of their criticism. And Foucault, even after 1976, so the first volume of the History of Sexuality, I'll be commenting on that text, but in his later lectures in 81, 82, he suggests that in fact Lacan was uh, useful for his own project. So it's a very kind of ambivalent and complicated criticism. It can't be approached in a simple uh, one-sided manner. Now, I would like to reformulate the problem of this conference in a slightly different way. So I'm not exactly going to fulfill uh, uh, the task of Lacan contra Foucault, but I would like to reformulate it in a slightly different manner. I would like to ask, so, what could we say about psychoanalysis from a Foucauldian perspective? How could we use sort of, Foucault's conceptual toolbox to say something about psychoanalysis that perhaps Foucault himself didn't say? So I don't need to mechanically repeat uh, just Foucault's own pronouncements of, about psychoanalysis, but I'd like to think about psychoanalysis from a Foucauldian perspective. Conversely, I would like to ask, from a Lacanian perspective, what can Lacanian theory tell us about uh, the conceptual sort of structure and perhaps the limits of Foucault's own project? So that would be kind of my double question. And I have to give a caveat that this is new material, uh, very much a work in progress. So we'll see how far I can get. Now, the focus of the presentation, the presentation is in three parts, and my focus will be on that one, that one great moment when somehow Foucault and Lacan met. And that has to do with a kind of debate over the interpretation of the painting, Velasquez painting, Las Meninas. So I'll get to that in the middle of my presentation. But first, let me begin with a kind of, let's see, a kind of naive, let's say, a kind of 
not stupid, but let's say naive reading of the, of the order of things. What did I say about like that? Um, first, I think the effect of the order of things on the reader is to produce a kind of shock. So first of all, human knowledge is not guided by a kind of continuous progression, but it proceeds in leaps and breaks. And second of all, the rules which govern the production of knowledge in a given era are not known to the individuals who are laboring under them, but they silently inform their inquiries and their researches, and they determine in advance the way that they formulate their problems and the kinds of solutions that can appear valid or invalid or truthful or, or, or false. So you could say the aim of Foucault's study is to excavate this substratum of implicit rules and to bring it to light. So its method is an archaeological method. And there are three main eras or epistemes in the book. The Renaissance, the Classical Age, modern times, and what points beyond modern times, Foucault's own project. But Foucault's archaeology of knowledge is not only a historical inquiry, but it's okay, a history of the present. So it's a reflection of the present state of knowledge, which is characterized by its own contingency, the contingency of its own rules, but it's also characterized by the knowledge that it's necessary to be submitted to some contingent set of rules. So, my question would be this, what is the existential impact of this kind of theoretical uh, proposition? So, how should I react? Let's say, how should I react to this uh, revelation that, for example, I too, right now, am working within an episteme or space of reasons whose rules and underlying logic I do not know, I do not understand, but they nevertheless are silently operating, guiding throughout all my work, they're guiding the way I'm posing questions right now, and they're determining not exactly the course of my inquiries or what I'm saying, but they determine the range of possibilities in which I can operate, in which my perceptions, my questions, my ideas will be formed. So, how should I react to this idea that actually I'm speaking, but behind me, I don't know it, but there's some secret rules that are actually guiding my discourse. I can react, I think, in two ways. One, should I just try to calmly go about my business and not worry about it, so I can just go along as if nothing happened? After all, I still have problems and ideas I'm interested in and I want to elaborate, so it's probably better I don't know the deep reason guiding my thought. That's not gonna help me uh, uh, in the actual concrete engagement of my intellectual interests. So better I forget about that. Thank you, Foucault, but okay, I don't need to know that. Or second, will the will to truth sort of force me to confront this blind spot of my knowledge? Okay, that never, this blind spot of knowledge that nevertheless makes my knowledge what it is. So will my will to truth force me to confront this and to try to devise a new way to somehow gain knowledge about that very void in my knowledge? To try to gain access to something which, in a way, I cannot know, uh, in, in the same way that a fish really can't know about the water in which it bathes, because it's simply the element of its world. Okay. Now, in the preface of the English edition of The Order of Things, Foucault explains the aim of his project is to, quote, to reveal the positive unconscious, and he underlines that, the positive unconscious of knowledge, a level that eludes the consciousness of the scientist and yet is part of scientific discourse. And he continues, Unknown to themselves, the naturalists, the economists, the grammarians employ the same rules to define the objects proper to their own study, to form their concepts, to build their theories. It is these rules of formation which were never formulated in their own right, but are found only in widely different theories, concepts, and objects that I have tried to reveal by isolating as their specific locus a level that I have called the archaeological. Now, in an interview in 1966, or at the same time of the book's publication, it's a very helpful interview in uh, La Quinzaine Littéraire, uh, Foucault kind of reformulates uh, the implications of his project in a more general manner. So, quote, In every epoch, the manner in which people reflect, write, judge, speak, including in the street, even the most everyday conversations and banal material, and even the manner in which people experience things, including how their sensibility reacts on an effective level, all their conduct is governed by a theoretical structure, a system which changes with ages and societies, but which is present in all ages and in all societies, end quote. Now, here's my naive reaction. Doesn't that sound a lot like psychoanalysis? And I wonder if we can even propose a kind of Freudianization of Foucault on that level. So what would it take to bring Foucault into psychoanalysis. Here I'm actually 
uh, kind of aping a question that was posed before by, uh, uh, by a Belgian philosopher, Rudy Visker, who asked about an existentialization of Foucault. And his problem was the relationship to Foucault to phenomenology. I'm interested in Foucault and psychoanalysis. So what would it take to bring Foucault into psychoanalysis, to shift from a kind of epistemological unconscious to a libidinal unconscious? So from a kind of historical a priori, a priori so that's a term that Foucault is using throughout the book, to a kind of singular a priori, which would constitute the rules of an individual unconscious, not the unconscious of an era, but an individual singular unconscious, and which would guide the psyche's sexual drives, its loves, its dramas, its pleasures, and its miseries. Now, in a sense, uh, this opposition also would have to be deconstructed, because Foucault is, of course, also interested in bodies and pleasures, and psychoanalysis also engages in epistemological problems. So we can't simply separate the epistemological unconscious, let me say, from the libidinal unconscious. And in fact, Foucault ends the book. So the conclusion of the book is some rather rousing pages about the importance of psychoanalysis in the general progress, in the general uh, project of an archaeology of knowledge or a history, you know, kind of history of being. So I want to examine Foucault's. So the concern of my my presentation is to examine Foucault's relation to psychoanalysis, but also to ask, after all, if at the beginning. Both psychoanalysis and so Foucaultian archaeology are posing a notion of the unconscious. What really separates them? Why is it not the same unconscious? Or is it? I think there's many passages, so I'm not going to go through through uh, careful reading of what Foucault says. Okay, and it take too long. But there's many very interesting passages. I just want to highlight one quotation uh, because I think on some points um, Foucault really gets things exactly right, and that Foucault and psychoanalysis are fighting a quite similar battle, which is still relevant in today's uh, field, so in contemporary philosophy. Let me give you just one quotation from, uh, from towards the end of the order of things. He says, whereas all the human sciences advance towards the unconscious only with their back to it, waiting, it, waiting for it to unveil itself as fast as consciousness is analyzed, as it were, backwards. Psychoanalysis, on the other hand, points directly towards it with a deliberate purpose, not towards that which must be rendered gradually more explicit by the progressive illumination of the implicit, but towards that which is there and yet is hidden." End quote. And I think here we see that Foucault's problem, and that's exactly the same problem with Lacan, is to formulate a positive notion of the unconscious, where the unconscious is not simply a hidden consciousness or is not simply the implicit presuppositions of our explicit behaviors and speech. So that you see that Foucault at this point is, is leading also a charge against, for example, the reading of psychoanalysis given in, by Habermas in knowledge of in human interests, but also more broadly, and today has become very relevant, this kind of deflated or pragmatic Hegelianism, which would make the philosophical task the explicitation of the implicit. So that psychoanalysis and Foucaultian archaeology would stand for a different project. I just want to point out you know, the, the kind of points of real uh, theoretical solidarity. Okay. Now, I move to the second part of my paper, the meat of the matter. Las Meninas. So I'm going to choose this one episode to try to delineate now a kind of distinction or a difference in the way uh, Foucault and Lacan approach the notion of the unconscious precisely through the reading of this sort of one concrete object, Las Meninas. Why do I... Uh, well, first some words about the painting, and then I'll explain a bit the position of this uh, work within the, <coughs> within the systems of Foucault and Lacan. So, Las Meninas. From uh, 1656, that is simply one of the greatest masterpieces in the whole of Western art, without exaggeration. Uh, it's been called the theology of painting. That was Luco Giordano's early description of the painting already in the 17th century, and later in the 19th century was described by an English painter as the true philosophy of art. Uh, there's probably perhaps no other painting that has been so thoroughly analyzed, discussed, talked about, every bit of the, the complicated play of perspectives analyzed, drawn out. I cannot engage with the sort of wealth of interpretations, and in fact, I have to say, I'm really going to try to reduce a lot of the the wealth of both Foucault's and Lacan's reading to what I consider the essential moment of their divergence. Okay. 
So for Foucault, it occupies kind of pride of place in the order of things. He actually published his analysis of the painting before the publication of Order of Things. It forms the very first introductory chapter. This is how he opens his book, so with the analysis of Las Meninas. And the painting comes back at the end of the book to delineate the rupture between the classical age of knowledge and the modern. So somehow this painting, while being located in one era, is so complex and let me say, such, such an ingenious representation that it also already points beyond itself to a new formation of knowledge. That would be the sort of greatness of uh, Foucault's reading. Now, Lacan deals with this at the same time, so 1966, in his 13th seminar, L'Objet de la Psychanalyse, The Object of Psychoanalysis. And the parallels are truly striking because Lacan's, that seminar opens with what will be published as an independent decree, uh, uh, Science and Truth, which also deals with the epistemological, so very, very similar to Foucault's project, it also deals with the epistemological conditions of psychoanalysis and the relationship between psychoanalysis and the advent of modern science. So Lacan opens the seminar with the same problematic that Foucault is going to be addressing, the scientificity of the human sciences in his case, but with the same problematic that Foucault is dealing with, and they both zero in on this painting as a kind of crucial representation to, to uh, elaborate the projects. Now, the difference is, of course, is that Foucault's interpretation is justly famous and has really achieved authoritative status, such that almost everybody who writes on this is simply forced to mention, at least, interpretation and in fact many other art historical interpretations recapitulate uh, the, the points that Foucault had already made uh, whereas Lacan's uh, interpretation remains basically unknown outside of analytic circles so very small audiences and it languishes still still in an unpublished seminar after almost 50 years after it was elaborated so we're dealing with uh, one interpretation which is truly, we can say, authoritative, and another which is basically unknown, still unknown today, and unpublished. You, you can't even really have access to it. Oh, there's a very good uh, edition of the seminar, French uh, edition online. But, uh, so let's start with uh, Foucault's analysis. Of Foucault's basic thesis is that Las Beninias is a pictorial representation of how representation functions. So somehow it's a kind of meta-representation. Uh, how representation functions in the classical age, so that covers roughly the 17th and 18th centuries. Quote, perhaps there exists in this painting of Velázquez the representation, as it were, of classical representation. Or as he says elsewhere, quote, representation undertakes to represent itself here in all its elements, end quote. Okay. So let me run through the, the essentials of Foucault's interpretation. First, he points out that the painter is standing behind the canvas, or he's taking a step back from the canvas. Is he in the middle of his work? Is he at the end of his work? Is he about to get started? We don't know. But he's working on a canvas within the painting, so he's working on a canvas, which we cannot see, because the canvas is turned to us. And the painter is looking at us. So the painter observes us from within the canvas, and it's as if he was looking at us, looking at him. So there's already an exchange of gazes. Now, there's an opposition in the painting between the far left, which you can hardly see, but there's a window here at an extreme angle, and from the window there floods in light. So the source of the light is coming in from the far, excuse me, from the far, uh, from the far right side of the painting, and the far left side of the painting is a kind of invisibility. So we have a juxtaposition of light, which bathes the scene, makes it possible to see, and the invisible canvas, which is turned away from us. Now there's a series of pictures in the back, other representations, but there is one representation in particular that shines with a kind of brightness, a strange light, and that is not a picture, but a mirror. And the funny thing is, is that that's the only sort of picture okay, mirror, that is visible, but nobody is looking at it. Now, what's the question of Foucault? What does the mirror reflect? And his other question, what is Velázquez painting on the, on the hidden canvas? That's what he wants to know. What is Velázquez painting on the hidden canvas? And of course, these are linked together. 
So Foucault's answer is, the characters in the mirror are King Philip IV and his wife Mariana, and in fact we can identify, I'm not going to go through that, but we can identify all the characters in the scene, and that was established quite early on by, uh, by a scholar. So, King Philip IV and his wife Mariana. So the whole scene is, Velazquez is painting, so this is Foucault's interpretation, Velazquez is painting a portrait of the royal couple who are standing in front of the canvas. There's also the juxtaposition of the, so the position is very interesting between the mirror, so the mirror which opens on to the outside, to an outside of the, of the canvas, and the doorway right next to it, the doorway which leads out in the opposite direction, and in which it's actually a, a, a relative of Velasquez, so Jose Nieto Velasquez, he's either entering or exiting, we don't know. Okay. So, also, there's a juxtaposition between the kind of continuous flow of the light from the window and the kind of instantaneous transposition in the mirror from the outside to the inside. So these are some of the details of his analysis. Now, also in the very middle of the painting, and that really fo that's really the, the, the focus, let's say, the center, of the true center of the painting, the subject of the painting, and its most attractive object, that is the Infanta Margarita, the princess, who is something like five years old, and is actually the only hope for the court. At that, at that moment, uh, she was the only heir. But later on, there's a brother. At that moment, she's the kind of focus also of the court's attentions and its desire to perpetuate itself. So the whole scene here is of the little princess and her attendants and other figures of the court around her. And it's as if, Foucault says, the entire picture is a kind of scene so it's not just a scene for us, but it's a scene that's staged for another gaze, which is the royal gaze, which is the king and queen in front of the painting, and the ones who are reflected in the mirror. So, it's the royal gaze to which everything else is subject in the painting. But this royal gaze is absent, the royal couple is absent from the picture, and yet it organizes the entire picture. So it's reflected inside the picture as something that is outside of it. Okay. Now, this is the real crux of, of Foucault's interpretation. What he says is fascinating about it is that this position of the royal couple actually, uh, uh, actually entails the superimposition of three different looks or three different gazes. So they're all superimposed on the same space which is absent from the painting. That is the model's look, the, spe the spectator's look, and the painter's look. So, Outside of the painting, you have the king and queen who are the model for the portrait that is being drawn by Velázquez. You have the spectator, so the person looking at the painting, and Velázquez himself as he's painting Las Meninas. So there's a kind of superimposition of these three different characters in a kind of invisible virtual space outside of the painting, indicated via a reflection. So it's a very sophisticated representational illusion. So this triple structure is also represented within the painting by three characters. The reflection of the king and queen in the mirror, the visitor, who's just entering or leaving, who stands for the spectator, and of course the painter who is painted himself. So the key point, again, is just to emphasize this, to be absolutely clear, is that the royal gaze, then, is both present and absent in the picture. The model itself the model itself for the picture cannot appear within it, but it can only be indicated through a kind of pale reflection. Okay. And in the final part of the book, Foucault will come back to this to show that this very sophisticated representation, which somehow its model and its subject can both appear within it, but only on the condition that it's ejected outside the painting, will summarize the contradiction the new mutation that happens in the transition from the classical scheme of knowledge to the modern scheme. Uh, I would like to go into that in more depth. I, let, me just, let me just say, okay, I, I can, very briefly, in the, in the classical epistemic, so in the classical knowledge, things, being, is a kind of order in itself. And knowledge is a kind of representation that is a secondary, so secondary representation of what already exists in itself. So that signs and things, representations and things, words and things belong in a way to two separate planes, which each have their own consistency. And 
what happens in the mutation from the classical to modern times is that, on the one hand, the representability of things is no longer considered part of their very nature. And they come to depend on one particular being, one particular thing among things, namely the human being or man. So in modern times, to be a thing does not mean to be a self-subsisting order, but it means to be historical. And to be grasped, and secondly, it means to be grasped not as kind of atomic units, but as bundles of relations. So Foucault will say the modern <coughs> ontology essentially is a conjugation of being and time. And also that being, to be, needs to be a kind of system or a system of relations. <coughs> now, why man? So this is the moment in which the human being is born. Man as a very specific, but as a very specific entity. Not just as a kind of anthropological, but a very specific entity. Why does man become the center of this new universe, new modern universe? Because man is the being through which beings become representable. Knowing is an operation external to things. So things are not inherently knowable. <coughs> their, their knowability has to be revealed to a knower. And second of all, representation uh, does not have a kind of autonomous structure. Or, or excuse me, just the reverse. Representation itself has a kind of autonomous structure and is not simply derivable from the things that they represent. So this would be the new. Now, the consequence of this, though, is that man becomes a very specific and unique entity because it's both a subject of knowledge and the object of knowledge. And the great philosopher of this for Foucault is Kant. The human being is defined as that being which is doubled in itself, existing both on an empirical level, which the different human sciences will now treat, but also constituted on a transcendental level, that it will be the knower to which the human being is revealed. And that this kind of split is what defines okay, modern philosophy. And what we see in Las Meninas is precisely that moment from within a classical paradigm, that split being, as it were, foreshadowed or anticipated, precisely in the fact that the subject of the painting this way, is both figured in it and outside of it at the same time. OK. I hope that's, that's, that's a simple, quick summary, but OK, I hope that's relatively clear. Now, what does Lacan say? What does Lacan say? <laughs> Now, Lacan really approaches it in quite a different manner. So for him, it concerns less an epistemological problem, so the status of representation in the classical age. It's less about an epistemological problem than, than a libidinal one. So as he says, the painting is a trap for the gaze. Its imagery kind of incites the spectator's desire, and it does something with this desire. And for Lacan, the ruse or the illusion of the painting is kind of trickier, I think. It's trickier than it is in Foucault, for all the sophistication of Foucault's reading. Uh, for Lacan, Foucault's analysis, okay, for all of its sophistication, it still remains on the level of the imaginary. And this is indicated, this is tellingly indicated by the emphasis Foucault places on the mirror within the painting, and the fact that the end point of his interpretation is a kind of reciprocal exchange of gazes between the model, the spectator, and the painter. The kind of endless circuit of substitution. Now, what this reading elides is the problem of the seeing subject and its desire, or more precisely, the desire that divides the subject. So Lacan's essential thesis is that the subject is not only a spectator who looks at the picture, but the picture, in a way, looks back. It looks back at the subject and frames it in its own manner. The subject's gaze is inscribed within the picture as something separated from it, as an object, an object that is the subject. The object divides the subject from itself, but at the same time it provides it with a material correlate, a kind of insubstantial corporeal substance. So the subject is thus not only outside the picture, surveying its scenery from a safe distance, but more profoundly it is drawn into the picture itself, it is caught like a flying glue, as Lacan says, and is presented there as an uncanny object. So this conjugation, this bringing together of synthesis of the divided subject with a partial object, in this case, the gaze, defines the structure of fantasy, 
And Lacan's argument will be, so that's why he addresses Las Meninas. Lacan's argument will be that Las Meninas provides a brilliant illustration of the visual structure of fantasy. So the painting for him is not a representation of representation, as it is for Foucault. So a representation that shows that the subject and the object of representation can never coincide in the same place, or that their coincidence can only take place in a void. Instead, he, he uses the term representative representation, the Freudian, Freudian term, the Borstel's representation. It means a representation, in, for Freud, it meant a, representa a representation of the drive. So it's a representation that provides a kind of mise-en-scene of the scopic drive and demonstrates how it is psychically inscribed. Okay, what, what do I mean by all that um, to be more concrete? So how does the um, painting accomplish this? Now, what's at stake in Las Meninas for Lacan is less a game of mere reflections than a window, the window or the frame of fantasy. So Lacan will insist that the, the window is the, is the key for understanding this, the frame, and not the mirror. The mirror is a kind of trap. So he contests the idea that the painter, within the painting, is painting a portrait of the royal couple who would be shown posing in the back of the mirror. And one of his very basic arguments is, this canvas is far too large. That makes no sense. <laughs> that, canvas is far too, that makes no sense you put the king and queen on the canvas like that. That's, that's crazy. That's a fairly convincing argument, I find. Um, that, that, that kind of cuts against the idea that somehow he's making a you know, a portrait of the royal couple, unless they're blown up to some sort of monstrous size. Um, so what's hidden, so here's another, uh, here's another option. What's hidden on the reverse canvas is not a portrait of the king and queen, but maybe the entire painting, the whole scene of Las Meninas. So he's painting himself painting the painting that he's painting. So Lacan kind of imagines it as a mise en abyme. The painting is kind of reproducing itself to infinity. Or else he suggests, that maybe there's nothing on the canvas, or that the very question is kind of the wrong question to ask. The very question is a kind of trap. So the painting wants us to wonder about what's on the other side of the canvas, and Foucault is sort of taken in by this game, and he produces a very brilliant interpretation, but that's what the painting wants us to do, in a way. That's the trick of the painting, but we have to analyze how that trick operates and not be caught within its trick. So the function of the canvas within the painting is actually to highlight the status of the painting as a completely fictional space. So it's not only to create a kind of illusion, but to make illusion appear as illusion, or to make the appearance appear as appearance. So Lacan reads classical art actually anachronistically. So he kind of reads classical art from a Duchampian standpoint. He does, it's not that art was once upon a time concerned with representing external objects, with providing a mirror onto reality, and then it only later came to reflect on its conditions and materiality and started producing non-representational abstract works or autonomous works. It's rather that works like the ready-made uh, reveal to us what pictures have always been, namely, quote, a big splash of color, a real thing, or, just to put it bluntly, a real piece of shit. <laughs> now, Lacan wants to make a link between this painting, so, again, in this kind of anachronism, he makes a link, and this is, very, um, this is a very interesting link, I think, and it has not been considered. I'm very surprised, but in the, in the, at least in the, the research I've been able to accomplish so far on the art historical reception, nobody else has made this argument. But Lacan says, if you want to understand what that painting is doing, so the canvas within the painting, Look at this picture. That's what it's doing. That it's somewhat similar to the visual trick of Magritte. Okay. This is this is painting of René Magritte, The Human Condition, from 1933. And in a way, he illustrates art's non-representational nature from within a representational space by producing this kind of tantalizingly paradoxical image. For Lacan, he quote inscribes a picture in a window. So what happens here is, instead of the painting, so normally, Magritte is playing with and exposing a certain representational illusion. Instead of the painting being a window, so we would think we would look through the painting, we look through and enter into its scene. And in fact, that's also the great seduction and the brilliance of Las Meninas and many other art historical commentators have said this. It, it really asks the, the spectator to enter into the painting as if we would walk into its space. Kind of inhabit it and look at all the complexity 
and that was said, this is what the grid shows itself, the structure of that illusion. We think we're going to enter into the painting, but in fact, oh, the painting is actually an obstacle in front of what it's supposed to be represented. That the painting itself is an object, or is a frame or window. So whereas a mirror would reflect an external reality, so again, Foucault's emphasis on the fact that we, we see this external point within the painting by its mirror reflection, a window provides a frame through which we can see, and fantasy is like a window on reality. That's the point. A frame which cuts it up and presents it within a certain coordinates. Normally, we don't see the frame, for not seeing the frame is the price we have to pay in order to have access to reality. And Lacan points out that in Magritte's painting, it's as if the ideal of his painting would actually be to destroy representation because you would imagine the painting would... Here we see only the difference between representation reality via the thin frame. It's as if the painting would grow large enough to truly cover everything, but then it would destroy its own light source, so we would be plunged into darkness. So the very ideal of the painting would be you, we could no longer see anymore if the illusion was somehow perfect. So that fantasy exists in a kind of <coughs> dehesions or kind of gap. Okay. So the, the key to the painting within the painting is this kind of Magritte, Magritteian um, uh, revelation, exposure of the uh, 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 illusion of representation. So we shouldn't enter into that illusory space but we should see that by marking that illusory space as, illu as illusionary, then something of that gaze, the look of the subject, emerges. A second small point. Another observation that Tom makes is that by doubling itself, so by effectively doubling itself, uh, I'm sorry, uh, one other element I forgot. Lacan, I'm not, I'm not sure of the truth of this, but it seems accurate. So Lacan said, this is the first time in the history of painting you see a painter representing himself as painting. And then he makes a comment I don't understand. He says, don't confuse this with the play within the play, because that seems like a very interesting connection. That one, one, could, one could look at the mousetrap in Hamlet, for example, and its function, and the function of the painting within the painting. But Lacan says, this is not the first time you have paintings within a painting, but the first time that an artist, a painter, represents himself painting within a painting. It's the first time in history of art. The function of that is to fictionalize the entire space. And then he says, objects, so the characters in the painting are not being represented, but he says they're en représentation. They're in representation, or they're showing themselves, showing off. They're all acting. Uh, and he even says, so he says it's as if the painting was a great tableau vivant. And, uh, and he makes a nice observation that even the dog somehow is a very good actor in this sense. <laughs> They're all acting. Maybe the whole key to the painting is the dog. Okay. But he points to another painting to compare it to, a uh, painting of Baltus. I'm not going to go into that, but my own uh, kind of um, uh, comparison. So, whereas Foucault highlights the fact that there's this kind of virtual um, crossing a virtual substitution of gazes, again, between the king and the queen, the spectator and the painter. Lacan will point out that one of the odd elements of the painting is nobody is looking at each other. Nobody actually returns a gaze. Everybody is looking, somebody is looking who's looking here, who's looking here, in a different direction, but there's actually no reciprocal exchange occurring in this painting whatsoever. And I think that the image which kind of striking and illustrates that would be something like yeah. from Marx Brothers. <laughs> Uh, where we see the fact that we have a kind of simulacrum of a kind of social interchange or kind of reciprocity which is being short-circuited at every moment. Everybody is pointing hands in the wrong direction as if, but, as if they would cohere together in a scene, but he doesn't. And I think something similar is going on in Las Meninas as well, that there's no, somehow there's no reciprocal engagement. Now why is the virtual picture so interesting, and you, uh, this, this Marx Brothers picture, and you know that um, it was mentioned in the earlier presentation that Arto was a great fan of the, of the Marx Brothers. You kind of see here a deconstruction of myth of sociality, really. That fundamentally behind this kind of uh, foundation, this kind of social foundation, you see that there's a fundamental detachment working in our attachments. Or beneath this kind of reciprocity of gazes, 
you see that there's actually not an exchange. And in showing that they don't exchange, actually the gaze appears. So going back to the last one. Quickly, how does Lacan describe the structure of this painting? So like Foucault, he also puts the Infanta, the Princess Margarita, at the center of it. And he imagines a kind of scenario. So just like Foucault imagines, OK, he's painting the, the royal portrait, Lacan also imagines a kind of scenario. He gives his own voice to the painting. He says, the princess is saying something like, let me see, or show me, fais voir. Show me, show me what you're painting. So somehow the princess is, is, is articulating the demand also of the spectator. We want to see what you're doing. Show me. And Velasquez replies, so Velasquez's re reply would be to the, to the Infanta, you don't see me from the point at which I look at you. Tu ne me vois pas, dude, je te regarde. So there is no reciprocity of the gazes, but precisely in the mismatch, let me see, and you will never see me exactly from the point at which I see you. In other words, there will be no exchange. The gaze emerges. And Lacan locates that gaze precisely in the interval, <coughs> the space between the painter and his object. So the gaze kind of somehow circulates in this mismatch between demands. On the other hand, this gaze is also covered over. This, this non-reciprocity is also covered over. Uh, by the seduction, the attractiveness of the princess himself, uh, herself, who is considered as a kind of a phallic object, the imaginary phallus of the, of the princess. And the entire scene, so also in a way green with Foucault, the entire scene is framed by the gaze of the big other. It's, it's staged for the royal couple, the royal gaze. This would be the structure of fantasy how the subject represents itself precisely as having disappeared from the picture. And yet, that very disappearance is somehow veiled or covered over by a fascinating object, which is seen from an external perspective. So I know I'm going rather fast, but in this, in this sense, Lacan wants to derive all the kind of essential elements to show how the painting reveals a kind of structure of fantasy. A pictorial representation shows the structure of fantasy. Okay. Next point. Okay. Let me just point one, one, one interesting moment when Lacan addresses Foucault directly. So th after giving his analysis of the painting, he addresses Foucault directly, and he, he makes a, one question. He says, quote, I put this question to you. Uh, do you believe or do you not believe when all is said and done, whatever may be the outline, the testimony, that we may have uh, about the lines on which the thinking of an epic took its assurance. Do you believe or not that there was always posed to the speaking being that exactly the same structural problems were posed in the same way for them as for us? And, and, and quote. So the concept, do you believe or not that in all these different historical epics, so throughout the history, the history of being, or the history of knowledge that you're writing, that the same structural problems were posed uh, for those earlier eras and for us. So he poses in very, very directly the historicist problem. Is there just a succession of epics, or is there a transcendental structure that repeats throughout these different historical moments? And I believe Lacan wants to push Foucault to say that the archaeological level on which Foucault is operating and which discerns the historical a priori, again, Foucault's <coughs> term, of different fields of knowledge, that this archaeological level would constitute itself a kind of invariant structure. So that one would have to posit an ahistorical a priori of the historical a priori, or a kind of transcendental condition of the historical variability of the transcendental even if this, the discovery of this itself is historically conditioned, it occurs at a certain moment, but it would be universally valid. In other words, what Lacan points to, and this is also the problem uh, clearly underlined in Foucault towards the end of the book, a kind of meta or hyper-transcendental condition of the very split in modern subjectivity between the empirical and the transcendental. Foucault's answer to this is, there is a kind of special access to this hyper-transcendental level 
but only in certain disciplines, which he calls counter sciences. And that would be psychoanalysis and anthropology, and what he calls pure theory of language, which is rather opaque, but refers to formalization and to Foucault's own project. I leave that aside. But in psychoanalysis, there can be a special access to this condition of the constitution of the split between the empirical and the transcendental, but only via a practice like transference. Okay, before moving on to the last part of the paper, let me review. So, when the classical age is eclipsed in modernity, man, the human being, is born as a subject object of knowledge. And this place is already indicated by the painting Las Meninas. The subject comes in place of the absent king, the sovereign whose presence is signaled by the mirror reflection, but he's simultaneously also out of the picture, cast out of the picture. So, Velasquez, from within a classical paradigm, anticipates the modern subject or the advent of mode, properly speaking. Now, for Lacan, on the other hand, what Velasquez does is to create, within the space of classical illusion, classical representational illusion, an illusion which unveils the structure of illusion, and which demonstrates how it is put together. And in doing so, he shows us something, uh, Velasquez shows us something about the nature of the drive to see. So what the painting reveals is not the doubling of the modernist subject, as it does for Foucault, but it shows the underside of this doubled subject. So it shows how, in order to constitute itself as an empirical transcendental doublet, this subject needs an unconscious support, the support of fantasy. So whereas Foucault locates Las Meninas between the classical and the modern, and he sticks in this way, he sticks closer to the actual date of the painting, Lacan situates it between the modern and the new form of thought that lies beyond it. So between man and the death of man. Except that for Lacan, the death of man is a very suspicious notion, like the death of God. So that he would rather say something like this. What the painting reveals is the structure of the underside of the modernist subject, not the eclipse of the disappearance, but the underside of the modernist subject, or the modernist cogito. And he says, at one point, Lacan says, not, I think therefore I am, but I paint, therefore I am. Which we could read, I make a fantasy. It's only on the basis of a vertiginous fantasy that the subject can actually say, I think I am. Okay. And in a way, perhaps we could also compare Foucault and Lacan's approach to this painting according to the old parable of Zeuxis and Parasios. You know, Zeuxis paints the grapes that are so, have such a great verisimilitude that the birds are trying to pick at them. But Parasios paints a veil, just a curtain. And Zeuxis said, well, let's see your painting behind the veil. Let's look behind it. He said, ah, that is the painting, he says. Which, that he shows appearance as, an appearance appears as appearance and not as illusion. And in a sense, I think Foucault gives a highly sophisticated account of the representational, illusional space of the painting, whereas Lacan wants to read the painting as the revelation of appearance as appearance. Okay. If I have a bit more time. Yes, okay. The last part, the third part of the paper then, 